region of Strathclyde. Not so much a region as a little world clustered round the bowl of the River Clyde. At the centre, a city, Glasgow. Over a million people live in this conurbation. Their home, workplace and market. Busy at all times, it is gripped by a twice daily spasm as the working day begins and ends with a surge of humanity. Buses are the worker bees in this crowded hive. A fleet of about a thousand serving the city. Unglamorous, unsung, unsentimentalized, and essential. To Glaswegians, their green and yellow livery is as familiar as the strip of a favorite football team. The team manager, in this case, is Strathclyde's passenger transport executive a statutory body which acts as the regional authority's agent for public transport over an area of 5,000 square miles, working closely with British Rail, the nationalised Scottish bus group and the independent bus operators, the airlines, Caledonian McBrain with its fleet of sea ferries, and directly operating the city's bus fleet and the new underground trains. The coordination of public transport, particularly in this dense conurbation, is most important. I think if we look at the concept, there's only one set of travelling public, and they're not interested whether a bus is red or green or a train is blue. They just want the, the most efficient system, as cheaply as possible and as reliable as possible. The passenger transport executive is therefore charged with developing a total plan of public transport to satisfy the needs of the people. And in this way, it is the only body to bring all the operators together in terms of pricing, marketing, and general performance of public transport. Well, with the change in the population distribution within the region and the growth in vehicle ownership and the change in travel patterns, it was necessary to take stock of the role of public transport and see how well or otherwise it was serving the community in which uh, it's based. This led to the development of uh, two projects after we had uh, looked to see how well we could build and what we had. Uh, these two projects, first of all, was the development of the Argyle line by making use of a tunnel right underneath the Argyle Street. We were able to link the railway networks north and south of the River Clyde for the first time, and that effectively integrated the two suburban networks north and south of the Clyde. And secondly, by uh, looking at the Victorian legacy of the Glasgow Underground, we were able to uh, see how that could play a very vital link within the development of public transport within the heart of the region by linking it with bus, with uh, rail, with car parks, and uh, by serving the local communities in which it lay. Glasgow has been lucky with its holes in the ground. Other tunnels reach out under some of its busiest streets, like shadows on an X-ray plate, along the east-west axis of the city. Once, they were traversed by suburban steam trains. Older citizens remember the choking smoke hole that was central low-level station until Dr. Beeching was brought in to make British Rail pay and perform surgery on this and other unprofitable lines. At last it was realized that this half-forgotten throughway was a hidden asset too precious to be abandoned. Now it emerges reinvigorated as the Argyle Line, so-called because much of its five-mile length runs under the famous Argyle Street. Side of the line is a new station created halfway along Argyle Street, deep down amid some of the biggest department stores in the west of Scotland. For two whole years, the most densely thronged part of Argyle Street itself was to be barred to virtually all wheeled vehicles, except the kiddies' pushchair and the shopping trolley. Party, the second completely new station on the Argyle line rises high above ground on its embankment where the tracks break ground. In fact, it's a twin, built over the spot where underground and Argyle line converge 
and a new underground station occupies the same site. The Argyle Line joins for the first time the network of electric railways which were separated until now by the great divide of the River Clyde. North and South, it seemed, never the twain should meet. Now tunnelers have supplied the missing link. discomfort made manifest, and for shopkeepers, perhaps moments of secret panic. When will it all end? Once a year, there was respite in Argyle Street. The workers departed, drills were dumb, pile drivers paused, and the festival began. Lights sparkled. Here comes Santa Claus. Glasgow, just for a time, got its favourite street back as a Christmas present. And there were other free shows. After all, watching men at work in holes in the ground is one of the great spectator sports. The astonished populace gaped as this miniature mock Jacobean castle, sitting in St Enoch's Square like a plump red hen, found itself floating on air, or rather on a concrete raft while work on the new underground station continued below. Much of the work was done far from public gaze, like the burrowing junction at Kelvin Hall, linking Argyle Line with the blue train system. Unseen also, the yellow giant, paving a base for the permanent way. A hungry monster chomping concrete and leaving behind it as it inched along a perfectly moulded and reinforced ribbon of track bed. Midway through the chaos of construction, they put on a pageant. A weekend of jolly getting to know your public transport. Everyone chips in from the Transport Museum to the firms supplying the very latest equipment for the underground. Hello, Jimmy. Any train to reach seven? Hello, Jimmy. Any train to reach number seven? Route number seven. Gone forever with the rest of the subway we once knew. Rapid transport in miniature for the Victorian city. A merry-go-round for workers and bowler-hatted bosses that began with trains hauled at the end of a tarry hawser and ended its first lease of life not so long ago as an all-electric curiosity of the 1970s. Nowhere else was there a system like it.
great metropolitan system like London's or Moscow's or New York's. In fact, every Glaswegian feels he has his own Hornby train. We don't need to buy expensive toys for Christmas because we've got the biggest model railway in the world. and I travel on it a lot. I always felt a sense of occasion because it was the only one of its kind in the world. I always used to feel that this was like being in toy time when you were sitting in it and it was very good for the liver. You get a wee rumble about, you know, so it kept you fit as well and it was a slight tourist attraction. People coming up from the south were always dying to go for a wee huddle in our subway. Because it's that small, well, we have like most train. I think it's marvellous how it's lasted so long. Oh, they're marvellously built, there's no doubt about that. Because these are original coaches, they were built in 1895. Very handy, this company. Glasgow folk declined to dignify it with such a grand title as underground. To them, it remained the subway. Antique units rode the six and a half mile merry-go-round on a bumpy four-foot narrow-gauge permanent way through twin tunnels under the centre of the city, passing 15 stations in the half-hour circuit with strange-sounding names to tell. Cowcaton. Killing Park, Merkland Street, Cessnock. Each one was austerely tiled in cream and green. And at each street level entrance, there lingered the authentic trademark of the subway smell. An indefinable, not unpleasant mustiness. The smell is still a great Glasgow legend. It varies from station to station. At Kelvin Bridge, it was a kind of mixture of cold steam and old dust, a bit like wash day in a slum but pleasant was it. And the other thing that went was it was the marvellous cool of the Glasgow Underground. Even during the very tropical heat waves, which as you know we have for about 11 months of the year in Glasgow, uh, you can retreat to the, the cool, calm, serene grotto of the Underground and restore the nervous tissues. The smell is something that people have threatened and tried to bottle for export, but like very fine and delicate wines, it does not travel. Okay, cat, take it off. In the depot, where trains were laboriously craned up through a hole in the ground, the only time they saw the light of day, ingenious craftsmen performed miracles of make-do and mend to keep the obsolescent stock on the rails. Reconditioning, adapting, even cannibalizing from trams as they went out of service. But in the end, the subway was running out of spare parts, just as it was running out of passengers as the tenement blocks above were demolished. And finally, the subway ran out of time. The twin tunnels fell silent. Well, we'll lose a, an awful lot of memories. At the same time, I believe that uh, progress must go on. With the promise of a substantial government grant, the decision is made to transform this jokey wee railway into the hub of an integrated transport system for Strathclyde, as progressive as any in the world. New stations, new signalling, new track, new rolling stock, new ideas above all, and the accumulated experience gleaned from underground systems built all over Europe in the last few years. had one advantage. It didn't need to start from scratch because the tunnels were already there and the capital cost is therefore relatively modest. The related disadvantage is that the line is more or less fixed and that working in 11 foot diameter tunnels first built for cable traction gives little elbow room for either designer or builder. Bye. 
rotten, very bad basis for water, particularly over the last few weeks, you know, when you've had this bad rain. It always comes in it, not only from the ground, all round, the sides of the tunnels, even the roof sometimes. Water, ever the tunnel of bane. And of course, there were plenty of headaches for all concerned, trying to meet the tightest of schedules. How to keep the merry-go-round going mucking out the tunnels at one end and feeding in plant and equipment at the other. How to make elbow room for a major engineering project confined in a circle less than three and a half meters in diameter. There was flooding, frustrating mechanical hitches, bugs in the electronics. mock-up of one of the modernized stations, but it's sufficiently realistic to attract the keen interest of British rail boss Sir Peter Parker and fellow guests. Showing them around with proprietary pride is the man at the center of Strathclyde's transport system, the Director General of the Executive, the late Andrew Mackay. Room to stretch and a capacity of 90 in each car when it's busy. 34 sitting, 56 standing. <laughs> Glasgow School of Art provided early inspiration for the design, aiming at a chummy cheerfulness to complement comfort and quiet running. I mean, this is going to be the original clockwork orange. <laughs> <laughs> Dodging sewers, main services and even underground streams. Nudging the base of old buildings. Bigger stations are scooped out and longer platforms built. A stretch of new tunnel is driven allowing the new train units to surface for overnight parking and access to the new repair shop complex at Boomloan. At nine of the 15 stations, escalators will carry passengers to and from street level instead of the former flight of steps. At Buchanan Street, a covered moving pavement will ease the way to Queen Street Station. As I say, the scene of the passenger transport executive's first open day, talking on transports coming to you today, this morning, from the top of a double-decker bus, an open top that's getting a wee bit chilly. The only things that are warm, in fact, are our ears. Do you want a big sailor here, yes? Do you want a big sailor here? Yes! Good morning, how are you? It's actually beautiful, it looks lovely. Body-wise, very nice. I think they're going to be very comfortable. First class, it's really first class. Terrific, beautiful, really good. It's a pleasure to travel, isn't it? Very good. Terrific, it's lovely. It's really luxurious. It is. And a wee seat inside it. Everything is beautiful, but it's great. I like the seats, I like everything. Very nice. It's nice to see that Glasgow is going to have something more than it last. I think the seats are the best. Nice and clean and fat. It's beautiful. Very nice for Glasgow. That's what they were needing. Something we can look forward to. Work on the Argyle line and the underground nears completion. Behind the scenes, long hours have been worked. Weekends have been eroded by passenger transport staff, by the consultants, by an unseen host. Now the shop troops move in. An army of tradesmen of many skills adding the finishing touches.
is set for the official opening and the arrival of a very special visitor. British Rail's most up-to-date technology has gone into the Argyle line. Brand new units for the trains. New or completely modernized stations. The line is a godsend to the crowded city, created for thousands of shoppers, business people and office workers who throng Scotland's busiest urban centre. Down in the depths of the earth, an orange revolution. The moment footsore Glasgow has been waiting for, and a city resumes its love affair with its little railway. That was terrific. That was my first ride and I thoroughly enjoyed it. It's smashing. Very comfortable, fast. Oh, it's fantastic. It really is. Oh, it's wonderful. Especially the stairs. No stairs to walk up. Oh, it was lovely. I really enjoyed it. It was lovely. What a difference from the old subway. Well, I'm very impressed. I used to go in the old underground and this is, this is really good. It suits the 80s, I think, in Glasgow. It's a credit to Glasgow. It's worth the money. Money well spent. A flat fare takes you anywhere on the circle. No need to worry about missing a train. The next one is only minutes away. Each of the 33 motorised cars, designed to operate in units as twins or triplets, is a highly sophisticated lookalike. A little technical marvel, with everything from radio link to complex automatic train control. Room loan, the eyes, ears and brain of the underground. A control centre where every aspect of the system is at the expert's fingertips. Television for an instant overview. A galaxy of winking lights to chart the progress of the trains. And next door, the new maintenance depot. A far cry from the make, do and mend that kept the old subway running far beyond its natural span. This is the precision-built heart of tomorrow's world. Link is a favourite word with the policy makers of the passenger transport executive. And they make switching between different types of transport easy wherever they can. At party, two escalator rides connect the Argyle line with the underground. At Buchanan Street, a moving pavement now eases the way to Queen Street Station. One aim of the new system is to ease the pressure of private car traffic in the city centre, in line with Glasgow's environmental policy, making it attractive for drivers to park and continue by underground. Equally, the underground complements bus routes, bringing more and more areas within easy reach of public transport users. Factories, offices, shops, cinemas and opera house are only an escalator ride away. 
while the underground and the guideline projects were major projects in themselves and acted as a catalyst towards the promotion of uh, Trans Clyde, uh, they are not enough in their own right. Uh, there is still a need to further develop public transport infrastructure, to rationalise uh, bus and rail services, to improve ticketing uh, facilities, to facilitate an interchange between bus, rail and underground. In furtherance of these policies, of Strathclyde's transport policies, we've introduced a special feeder bus services, we've introduced um, car parks at suburban stations, we've built uh, bus stations in a number of locations, uh, we've introduced express buses on urban motorways, uh, there are special services in Gypsy and many bus services in the rural areas. And these are all part of the broad range of activities that are involved in improving public transport within Strathclyde. Efficient transportation is no luxury, it is a necessity, and the fabric of modern life would decay without it. The extension of public transport is a tool in the reconstruction of a community. We are really uh, very much concerned in developing a fully integrated and coordinated uh, system of transport because of its importance, if you like, in many aspects of uh, people's lives. Uh, mobility, uh, development of industry, amenity, the environment, and uh, well, nearly everything you mentioned is affected in some way or other by public transport. And we consider it as one of the most important aspects of Strathclyde region's policy. Two and a half million people live in Strathclyde. A world in a small space. A living world, pulsing with energy. Public transport is a lifeline. And that lifeline, charged with new energy at the birth of the underground and the Argyle line, is the integrated, up-to-the-minute system that bears a proud name, Transclyde. <laughs>